Good day, May 40 here. So standing by waiting for Iran to attack Israel. I have an impulse just wants to <laughs> look at, at Twitter every every minute to try to find out what's going on in the Middle East. So latest word is that uh, Iran will probably attack uh, tomorrow. I just heard a perspective that I hadn't thought of or considered before that explains why the Biden administration is particularly reluctant to allow Israel to fight back against Hezbollah and Iran. So Iran funded and prepared Hamas for its October 7 massacre of Israelis. It has funded and prepared Hezbollah to launch thousands of missiles into northern Israel, which has forced about 80,000 Israelis to move away from the north of the country. So Iran has effectively shrunk the effective living space of Israel. And so now that uh, Israel has assassinated two key leaders in the Hezbollah and Hamas ranks that are supported by Iran, what the heck happens next? How should we understand Joe Biden, Kamala Harris's foreign policy? Here's a perspective from Michael Duran, who used to serve in the George W. Bush administration. We would find out that you remember back in uh, 2020 when uh, Barack Obama uh, uh, called up Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar and said, please get out of the, uh, the Democratic primaries because the, uh, the non-Bernie Sanders vote is being divided among all of you. And I've decided I've anointed Joe Biden as the Democrat, the non-Sanders uh, leader of the party. Uh, and so we will consolidate all the vote behind Biden. Uh, so they all dutifully got out of the race and, and, then, and, then, not, and then Biden uh, became and a nominee. So, uh, so then later on, Bernie Sanders came in behind, um, came in behind Biden. And I, I, I think, I can't prove this, but I think part of the deal with the progressives when they, when they came to this, consolidated the party in this way, was that the, the Biden administration would uh, agree to no new uh, carbon energy projects. And one of the things that they did, it, this actually leaked out, they sent a, a cable to all posts all around the globe that we will not, and by the way, Amos Hochstein is the, is, happens to be the point man on, 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 on all of this. We will not support any carbon energy initiatives anywhere in the world, not, in, not on American shores and not, and, and, uh, um, and, and, and not, and not globally. So if there's no new carbon energy uh, uh, proposals that the U.S. is uh, uh, directly backing, then it, it needs Venezuelan oil, it needs Iranian oil, and so on to keep the prices uh, to keep the prices down. So their their energy policy is bound up in their Iran policy. Uh, their the Iran nukes policy, I mean this appeasement policy is, is bound up in that. Um, and of course the, the the Department of Defense is busy with a war in Ukraine, um, worried about a war in Taiwan. The last thing it wants is a major buildup, a U.S. buildup in in uh, in the Middle East. And so they think the easiest way to get to a quiet life in the Middle East is to shut down Israel's war in Gaza rather than to escalate against Iran. Yeah, it's interesting how the Green New Deal approach is also um, working to Iran's advantage. Let me just drill down for a moment on the nuclear issue. Um, I know, I remember, because I wrote about it at the time, a week before October 7th, um, on a Friday afternoon news dump, the Department of Defense said that Iran was only, only you know, less than two weeks away from having enough material to assemble a bomb. Recently, um, Secretary of State Blinken more or less repeated that. Um, is it now basically American policy that Iran is a nuclear threshold power, if nothing, you know, if, not, if nothing else, at the very least, and that that is something that you know uh, the United States uh, tolerates or even tacitly approves of? I, I think basically, basically yes. Uh, that's the. Uh, uh, I don't know that that would be the policy of the uh, of the Trump administration, but rolling any of this back is going to be very difficult. And uh, um, uh, but but clearly the. Uh, it was always obvious to me. Again, this is not something I could prove, but it it was always obvious to me uh, that when you listen to him and his senior officials talk, I'm talking about President Obama, that President Obama asked himself a question, and the, and the question was, is it worse for Iran to go nuclear, to become a nuclear power, or is it worse for the United States to go to war, to carry out serious military action against Iran to prevent it from becoming a nuclear power? And he decided uh, that the worst thing was for there to be American military action. And that basically green-lighted. You know, it, it set us on the path to where we are, where, where we are now. Okay, so one of the most talked about stories on uh, Twitter right now is that Doug Emhoff has admitted an affair with his nanny. 
he got pregnant and she did not carry through with the baby. I'm not sure if that means she put her up for adoption. It's not all clear. When Kamala Harris was being vetted to be vice president of the United States, the Harris campaign disclosed this to Joe Biden's campaign that uh, Doug Emhoff had had an affair. It's curious then that the Harris campaign has put Doug Emhoff out there so publicly making the case for abortion. Why, why would you put, put a guy like this in, who's damaged goods out there to make the case for Jewish values and for abortion? So if Doug Emhoff had simply lived his life as a private citizen rather than as a political activist, his affair would receive far less scrutiny. But uh, Kamala Harris, knowing all about her husband's affair with his first wife, right, she has chosen to put abortion at the center of her political campaign. That she's raising the salience of this story. And I know that uh, Jews are not thrilled that Kamala Harris's husband, Doug Hamhoff, has been out there publicly talking up Jewish values for years. So just empirically, in my experience, that the Jews who most practice Judaism, the Orthodox, are the least likely to talk about Jewish values because we understand Jewish obligations, in particular legal terms, and there's much less discussion of these amorphous Jewish values categories. The Jews least likely to practice any Judaism are the most likely to talk to the world about Jewish values. I noticed when I read a book on Hollywood that the people who most dis likely to describe their, their Jewish upbringing as very religious were almost never Orthodox Jews. Uh, Orthodox Jews don't tend to talk about religion. And, and those who grew up with the, with the most discipline and with the most religious commitments in Jewish life are, are the least likely to talk about these obligations in religious terms. They're, they're understood more in terms of something called Yiddishkeit, which is Jewish tradition. So Steve Saylor has an important blog post. Why in 2014 was the second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, a reasonably good-looking 50-year-old guy who was making about a million dollars a year as a Century City lawyer, why was he available to marry his 50-year-old Kamala Harris? Right, They were born seven days apart in October 1964. Turns out this was because Doug screwed up his first marriage to the mother of his two kids by knocking up his kid's school teacher whom the Amhoffs also occasionally hired as a nanny. Now, why is this relevant? Well, Kamala Harris has chosen to run her campaign on the issue of abortion. Now, the Daily Mail it emphasizes the pregnancy, but the New York Times ignores that angle, right? Because the pregnancy raises too many interesting questions for the New York Times to tolerate. Pregnancies are interesting. The New York Times, 10 million paying subscribers, don't read the New York Times because it's interesting. They read them... Because they read the Times because it bores them into assuming that their worldview is unquestionable. Now, much of the New York Times approach to news stories that raise uncomfortable questions for liberals and for Democrats is boring, but much of the coverage outside of that tends to be well-written and not boring. Steve Saylor says, My impression is the median American voter finds abortion grotesque and would like the government to derogate other people being so sloppy as to be getting abortions. On the other hand, the median voter would, now that they think about it, like abortion to be legal, just in case, God forbid, their daughter happens to be impregnated by that loser boyfriend of hers. Now, the legalization of abortion's impact on male behavior is not a much-discussed question, and it, this question might be brought to the surface in talking about the second gentleman's conundrum. I don't know what happened to the second gentleman's unborn child, but it's obviously an intriguing question. So let's say that the reason Doug Emhoff was available to marry Kamala Harris was because his kid's school teacher and nanny, whom he impregnated, had an abortion. So therefore, he wasn't under social pressure to marry her, right? If he was uh, just a prominent attorney, he would be under more social pressure if he was in a traditional community to marry her. Or did uh, his nanny mistress school teacher give up the baby for adoption? Did he pony up the money? For her to raise the baby as a single mother? Did he not put up the money? All right, th these are all relevant questions to the abortion policy question that uh, Kamala Harris is raising. Let's get a brief overview of the news here from Outcast. Matchup to its essence, a former president against a vice president who replaced the incumbent president, it might look like this. You know who's playing weird? She's playing weird. She's a weird person. And just be plain weird? It's the weirdness Olympics, you might say. In an interview with Fox's Laura Ingram, Donald Trump was asked how world leaders would treat Kamala Harris if she wins the election. She'll be like a play toy. 
They look at her and they say, we can't believe we got so lucky. They're going to walk all over her. And I don't want to say as to why, but a lot of people understand it. Harris roused a big crowd in Atlanta over Trump's mixed signals on debating her. So I think uh, Donald Trump there is hinting about uh, she's probably more vulnerable to being bullied because she's so insecure, right? She got a start in politics as Willie Brown's mistress, right? She's great when she's scripted, right? She can be great. She can rise to the occasion when she's scripted, but uh, foreign negotiations are not always so scripted and she's less likely to raise to the occasion. Because as the saying goes, if you got something to say, say it to my face. But most of the mainstream media are showing virtually no interest in the extremely liberal things that Harris has said in the past, in stark contrast to their voracious appetite for any controversial utterance by J.D. Vance, the only scrutiny coming on Fox and from some conservatives. So apparently the Kamala Harris uh, campaign is anonymously leaking stuff to the New York Times because remember, we've been talking about how when she was running for president 2019, 2020, she said some crazy stuff. It's all on tape. She's not actually for that stuff anymore. I think a lot of people want to see the media doing its job. Let's ask serious questions about Kamala Harris's record. Let's ask about the quite stridently left wing positions she was taking as recently as 2020. Shouldn't that be part of the media's responsibility? I'm Howard Kurtz, and this is Media Buzz. Thanks, Howard. Let's fast forward. The group's co-chair resigned, partly because of the invitation. April Ryan, who shared a mutual disdain with Trump, said bringing him in was unacceptable because he's an authoritarian. And the panel, which included Fox's Harris Faulkner, began with this question, more of a denunciation, really, by ABC's Rachel Scott. You have pushed false claims about some of your rivals, from Nikki Haley to former President Barack Obama. Okay, if, if Donald Trump is an authoritarian, what, what were the preferred liberal left uh, policy options during COVID of, of shutdowns? I, I am not a lawyer referring to the question in the chat. All right, for any emergency in every functioning democracy, there are virtually unlimited emergency powers that are available, real emergency, punitive emergency. A government just has to invoke the threat of an emergency to take away any right, such as we saw during uh, COVID, the initial periods, the, the lockdowns, your right to freedom of assembly, your right to freedom of movement, right, your right to petition the government in the form of a rally were all taken away. So in an emergency, any government can take away your rights. It was the left, generally speaking, who wanted much stricter lockdowns and more revocation temporarily of rights in the face of this COVID emergency. And generally speaking, by a ratio of about two to one, I, I think the left was right to institute lockdowns. Not every lockdown, right? Not every aspect of the lockdown was correct policy. But generally speaking, I think a national response to a health emergency like COVID, uh, lockdowns in the early stages, encouraging people to get vaccinated. I think, generally speaking, by a ratio of about two to one, the, the left was more right than the right with regard to COVID. Now, at certain points, I think that the right was right, such as uh, perhaps when Florida reopened under Ron DeSantis before most other states, you can make it a good case that that was good policy. But wh which side is more authoritarian? It, doesn't seem like a particularly uh, compellingly clear question and answer, right? The left was more authoritarian in its uh, desired COVID responses than the right. In, in other areas, the, the right may well be more authoritarian, but which side is more authoritarian probably depends upon the circumstances. Obama saying that they were not born in the United States, which is not true. You have told four congresswomen of color who were American citizens. And, and this, uh, this question is dirty because she is lining up uh, five, five examples, arguments, uh, diminishments of Donald Trump before finally getting to her question. So this is a dirty tactic, right? A responsible tactic would be to ask one thing at a time. So it's no wonder that Donald Trump reacted badly to that question. To so go back to where they came from. You have used words like animal and rabbit to describe black district attorneys. 
You've attacked black journalists, calling them a loser, saying the questions that they ask are, quote, stupid and racist. You've had dinner with a white supremacist at your Mar-a-Lago resort. So if you can't ever call any black behavior stupid or, or dub or idiotic, right? So Rachel Scott is arguing essentially that uh, black should be off limits to criticism or stinging criticism or public stinging criticism uh, as black simply because they, they possess some sacred status that they should be off limits to criticism. So my question, sir, now that you are asking black supporters to vote for you, why should black voters... Okay, that's, that's not really a question. It's a rant packaged with examples presented in a way to make Donald Trump look stupid. ...trust you after you have used language like that. Well, first of all, I don't think I've ever been... After you've used language like that, you could do the same thing to Rachel Scott. You could say, Rachel, based on your public comments here and here and here, like, why would anyone trust you based on you using language like that? You can select examples from anybody's life and make them look like a complete blithering idiot while remaining 100% factually accurate, right? Because we, we've all said things that taken out of context or even taken within context make us look uh, idiotic, dangerous, psychotic. Ask the question. So there's a protocol to interviewing, all right? There's airline pilots. They follow protocols. Hospitals follow protocols throughout the professional world, there are protocols followed because you tend to get better results when people are habituated to following protocols. You do this, 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 this in this particular order. You check this, 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 this. And this habituation tends to produce more safety and better results than allowing people just to choose uh, situations on their own. And there is a protocol for asking questions if you want to elicit the best answers and one one protocol is you don't put moral judgments in your questions you ask open-ended questions and so her question not really a question and it's designed to shut donald trump down when people are the recipients of your moral judgment they, they don't tend to open up to you so what she she's doing is violating all protocols for a productive interview for the sake of appearing tough to her reporter peers. So, in, in such a horrible manner, the first question. <laughs> you don't even say, hello, how are you? Are you with ABC? Because I think they're a fake news network, a terrible network. <laughs> and I think it's disgraceful that I came here in good spirit. Uh, I love the black population of this country. Joining us now to analyze the coverage in Utah, Jason Chaffetz, the former Republican congressman and Fox News contributor. Okay, uh, we're expecting to hear today or tomorrow the Democrats' vice presidential pick. And there's a fascinating angle to this is that it is a completely acceptable part of contemporary discourse to question whether the Democrats hate uh, Jews too much to allow for the selection of a Jewish vice presidential candidate, because on the face of it, Josh Shapiro, governor of Pennsylvania, seems to make the most sense. We had the mayor of Philadelphia leak that uh, Josh Shapiro was going to be the vice presidential nominee on Friday. That happened. Was that just uh, incompetence, or was this part of a strategy? Often, political operations will leak things in advance, such as prospective uh, picks, to see what the public reaction is. Now, why is it just uh, considered completely acceptable for mainstream discourse to inquire, uh, do, do Democrats just hate Jews too much to allow for a Jew to be the vice presidential nominee? Because if this situation occurred among Republicans, then the news media would be up in arms that this is outrageous. But you don't notice any outrage on behalf of the mainstream media over questioning whether or not uh, Jews whether or not Democrats can select a Jew. This is just conventional accepted discourse. All right, here's uh, Jonah Goldberg. I don't know. I mean, what does Rashida Tlaib say if he picks a Jew? And I just find the, the, the sort of the dog not barking on this point 
really kind of fascinating. And I do think it's worth our time. That said, uh, what else are we going to talk about? Jonah, let me just follow up. If she doesn't pick Shapiro. So let me back up. To me, the the three issues that you're looking for in a VP, if you're smart and not the Donald Trump and his uh, field of folks, um, popularity, she needs to moderate the ticket, um, and uh, swing statiness. And Shapiro wins on all of those. He has the highest favorability in his state, uh, over 60%. Um He's clearly a moderate. He would he would send that message that Chris was talking about on like the the vibes of like, hey, look, see, I like people who are moderates. And there is no path to the White House that doesn't run through Pennsylvania. So whether he absolutely can win Pennsylvania or not, it almost doesn't matter to even give you the better shot at winning Pennsylvania is worth a whole lot. And so then the question comes, so why would you ever not pick Shapiro? And the answer seems obvious because you believe that your voters are too anti-Semitic to tolerate Uh, a Jewish guy on the ticket. And we've seen that, right? So Kelly shows up for the Netanyahu speech. No one's protesting him as a pick. Shapiro's actually criticized Netanyahu, but they're protesting him. What's the difference? It's clearly not their positions on Israel. Uh, One of them's a Jew. So if she doesn't pick Shapiro. So I don't like the framing of anti-Semitic because it, it moralizes the brutal reality that different groups have different interests, right? the interests of Palestinians or the interests of many different groups predispose them to have a negative perspective on Jews or at least the Jewish state, right? If different groups have different interests, then if your group has a negative reaction to blacks or to Jews, it it may not just be bigotry and ignorance. It just may be that the interests of your group go against the interests of a different group, which I think is brutal reality. Right? Sometimes the interests of Jews and Chinese are contradictory, or the interests of Jews and blacks, or the interests of Jews and Gentiles, or the interests of Jews and Arabs, or Jews and Muslims are at odds. Right? Different groups tend to have different hero systems, tend to want different things. Human desires are infinite. Uh, material resources are limited. Inevitably, Jews, uh, groups are going to come into conflict with each other. I, I don't like the unnecessary moralization of what simply boils down to significant conflicts uh, of interest. So is it uh, Gen X Democrats or boomer Democrats who are quote unquote anti-Semitic? Well, younger Democrats are more likely to have anti-Jewish attitudes because they are more likely to be uh, people of color who have a hero system and a worldview and, and sympathies that are more likely to be at odds with majority Jewish Hero systems and interests. Is it anti-Semitism? And does that itself mean she kind of has to pick Shapiro? No, I mean, like, I, I don't want to go that far. I mean, you can actually make an affirmative case for Waltz, I think. Uh, he's, you know, he's the one who launched a thousand memes with the weirdness thing. He's, um, he's really good at talking Midwestern and talking like a high school principal and a co- football coach. He won a... a, a Republican district, the only one to win that district in a long time. Um, and even though he, it's tragic, even though he's only like six months older than uh, Kamala Harris, he looks like he's from the World War II generation or something. It's sort of like me and David French. David's only like five months older than me, but he looks like, you know. Um, My he was son just has un- never called you great grandpa. <laughs> um are you my so, grandfather nate said but adoringly? i do think <laughs> I, I think that's fantastic and i will be calling him great grandfather from now and forth but um I, I i do think it's worth raising the question okay so why you know why didn't you pick shapiro right i mean like i think that's a perfectly legitimate question in an interview it could be one she completely screws up one of the arguments you hear is that shapiro is really slick He's kind of got a little bit of a Buttigieg kind of like too clever for his own good kind of vibe. And that it is not the kind of vibe necessarily that Harris wants. I mean, I think he, she should pick a, a Shapiro, but I think you could come up with other, you could talk yourself out of it for reasons, reasons other than, you know, uh, rank anti-Semitism. Can I just say, guys, Mark Kelly has been to space, okay? Yeah. I think Mark Kelly has a lot going for him. But again, on those three categories, I mean, he is popular. 
Arizona is an important state. He is more moderate than she is, but he's just like. Okay, so the Democrats chose to put Doug Emhoff out there publicly to make the case for abortion. So let's uh, let's get some audio. Doug Emhoff traveled to Georgia to hold an event focused on mobilizing men to advocate for reproductive rights. He joined NBC's Yamiche Alcindor after the event for an exclusive interview. It's a topic rarely discussed and one the second gentleman is focusing on, the role men can play in advocating for abortion rights. It is a medical health care crisis. On Tuesday, in an exclusive interview with NBC, Doug Emhoff said he wants men to see reproductive health care as an issue impacting the fundamental freedoms of everyone. This is a issue of fairness to women. Women are dying. Um, it's affecting men's ability to plan uh, their lives. And it's also an issue of what's next. What, what other freedoms are at risk? Emhoff spoke to NBC in Atlanta, where he convened a panel on the role men can play in pushing for abortion access. The event was timed to mark the fifth anniversary of Georgia's six-week ban on most abortions. Being in this position of being second gentleman and also being the first man ever to be in this role, um, it, it just would be... So the Democrats chose to put him out there knowing that he'd had an affair and gotten his, his nanny pregnant. So when you put yourself out there publicly advocating for something, and then it turns out that your private behavior is relevant to the public policy position that you're articulating, right? you are inviting scrutiny of your private behavior. Wrong for me not to use this microphone to advocate for this issue. What's your message? to the many male lawmakers that we've seen be part of restricting abortion rights. Stop it. Listen to the people in this country. See what's going on. Listen to doctors. Listen to nurses. Uh, listen to men and women. who. There's, there's no profound moral wisdom that is exclusive or predominantly coming from healthcare workers, right? A doctor or a nurse in, in inherently, intrinsically have no more superior wisdom on the morality of abortion than plumbers and landscapers. Who are suffering because of those actions. As part of his efforts, Emhoff said he's been talking to men across the country and in his personal life. I'm talking about this with my other dad friends. I'm talking about it with my son, about how... I'm talking about this with other men who have affairs and get uh, women who have much lower social status than them pregnant. So this woman got fired from her job, right? His kid's school teacher at the, the Willow School in Culver City, right? She got fired from her job because he impregnated her. So there are all sorts of vices, as Adam Smith makes clear in his 1776 book, The Wealth of Nations, that the upper classes can engage in with the relatively little price to be paid that can be absolutely devastating for the lower class. So middle class kids, for example, they can often listen to rap music. They can often enjoy promiscuous sex and some pornography and dabble in drug use without it destroying their lives. But any of these individual vices for people with fewer resources, perhaps less discipline, lower IQ, would be absolutely devastating. And what people on the top of society do right, trickles down to below. And so high IQ people with a lot of resources can get away with a lot of these vices, which when adopted by the lower classes will be absolutely devastating. How this is going to impact him and, and how he's going to start a family or not. Yeah, he's out there and he's getting people pregnant as he's promiscuous and that can really get in the way of your career. Tuesday's event was a collaboration between Emhoff and a group called Men for Choice, which has held other gatherings with the second gentleman. So I'd say about half of the women I've known well have had abortions. I had a girlfriend to put it this way. Uh, abortion is just something that every woman goes through, right? She was a secular left-wing Jewess. She said that she'd never had an abortion, but it does it does seem what, what what are the statistics is it is it uh, approaching 50 percent of women who have abortions cecil price the third is a morehouse student and a member of men for choice it hurts me um to see that potentially the rights 
uh, of my sisters, of my mother, uh, can be taken away. Uh, and I have a responsibility and a duty as a brother, but also as a leader, to advocate for them. Meanwhile, several women, including Shawana Moore, said they welcomed men organizing around abortion. We need Wow, what a, a completely one-sided uh, NBC News report. All hands on deck. Moore, a nurse, said her husband speaking up for her soon after she had their son saved her life. I had to have an emergency C-section. So I had too much bleeding and my blood pressure was basically plummeting. But it was my husband who really advocated for my health and well-being. And uh, Good comment in the chat. Uh, Doug Emhoff is playing to the banging the babysitter demographic. And... Uh, okay, of men I know well. Uh, my my sense is that probably a quarter, a third of them have uh, banged the babysitter. Right, men I know well tend to have resources, and uh, they tend to have successful careers. Uh, they tend to be millionaires, and uh, they tend to have babysitters and. Uh, most men are willing to risk everything for the opportunity to have sex with a young, attractive woman. That's critical. Meanwhile, like his wife, Vice President Kamala Harris, and President Biden, Emhoff pointedly criticized. For and, and why does it matter? Because if a man is enjoying a great sexual relationship, he is going to be more willing to sacrifice and protect that woman who he's banging on a regular basis than anyone else, right? He'll be more likely to sacrifice and protect her than his own wife, than his own kids, than his job, than his reputation. All right, a man will, will give up everything to protect the woman that he's banging. And so that's why the sex life of uh, politicians is important because the, the normal man is going to give his highest priority to the woman with whom he's having great regular sex. Former President Trump. And this is why women in particular fear uh, men having affairs, because a man is most likely to direct his resources towards the woman that he's having the most sex with. And underscored what he believes is at stake in November. This is a binary election. You've got the former president on one side who is celebrating the overturn of Roe v. Wade, saying women must be punished. And then on the other side, you've got Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, who are on the right side of each and every one. So between 1994 and 1995, I slept with about 20 women. And I, I'm neither proud nor ashamed of this. I don't think it's morally good. But I, this is the perspective I take on my past because it best enables me to talk honestly and to reflect honestly on my past. I was doing the best I could to meet my needs with the tools that I then had at my disposal. One of the downsides with a great amount of promiscuity is that it also ironically incurs the most astronomical amounts of self-control to keep it from being ruining. So uh, on the one hand, you're exhibiting the least self-control because you're willing to consistently drop your standards to get off. So a lot of the women that I slept with were, were women that I would not want to be seen in, in public with because they were perhaps uh, quite overweight. Uh, on the other hand, there were a handful of occasions, uh, maybe three occasions in total, where I was just starting a sexual relationship with a woman and I'm engaging in intercourse with her and she changes her mind and says, stop, I don't want to do this. And it took every ounce of my self-control to stop in those situations. And I did. I, I think it only happened about three times, but it was absolutely excruciating to stop in the middle of sexual intercourse but that's the kind of self-control that you must exhibit if you're not going to get someone pregnant or you're not going to vastly increase your chances of crime. There's a terrific Netflix uh, true crime documentary series, uh, Homicide LA, Homicide New York, just chilling stories of, of murder and how they, they caught the murders. Once you start having affairs, once you start becoming sexually promiscuous, you are likely bringing in a whole lot of chaos to your life and people will often kill over sexual affairs. And when, when you're having these intimate you know, sexual liaisons with people you don't know very well, the, the chances of things just going wildly out of control incredibly spiral, and they demand levels of self-control that you don't have to exhibit in normal life. You don't want to have to rely on your self-control because we all only have limited amounts of our self-control, and ideally you want to set up a, a life where you depend on your self-control as little as possible. But if you are sexually promiscuous, you're often going to be called upon to use 
every ounce of your self-control if you want to stay out of trouble, if you want to avoid catching an STD or spreading an STD or getting someone pregnant or you know, violating their consent, uh, understanding what uh, constitute consent has dramatically changed over the past few decades. Whew. Uh, I, would, uh, I would go to parties and I'd, I'd pick up on certain women and on at least one occasion, maybe two occasions, I remember being alone in a car with a woman or, or going on a first date with a woman and I'm highly attracted to her. She seems to be highly attracted to me and I'm just starting to make my physical move on her and she'll go, I, I need you to know that I'm married. And then it would take every ounce of my self-control to stop because I, I always had the moral standard. I should not, you know, never must uh, ruin someone's marriage. I, I should never you know, have sex with a married woman. To the best of my knowledge, I, I never did. But it would require every ounce of my self-control because married women will sometimes use the affirmation that they get from men wanting to date them, men being attracted to them. And so they will taunt you and tease you and play you along. And then when, when you're most vulnerable, they'll spring on you that uh, she is married. And it's like, ah! And wow, all right? So th there are feats of self-control that, that people with, say, an extraordinary history of self-control or with uh, more resources than your average person or a higher IQ, someone is better able to see the future and the consequences of not exercising incredibly painful levels of self-control is going to pull off that someone with a 100 IQ and, and fewer resources is going to be less likely to pull off. I mean, civilization would fall apart if everybody had the, the number of sexual partners that I have had, particularly in my year of promiscuity, 1994 to 95. And I slept with far fewer people than I could have because many times I just was not psychologically up for messing around. All right, there were countless occasions when attractive women that I guess part of me wanted to sleep with, but I just wasn't up for the, for the challenges and, and complications and, and the vulnerabilities that come with an intimate sexual encounter. But back to this NBC News report on Doug Emhoff's campaign for abortion rights. One of these issues. And Yamish joins me now on set. Thank you so much for bringing us this interview. And look, the president, the vice president, the second gentleman. Okay, here is uh, Doug Emhoff on his Jewish heritage. As the world prepares to mark International Holocaust Remembrance Day in honor of the six million Jews and millions of others murdered by... Right, if you want to speak out making the case for Jewish values and the beauties of being Jewish then your own private behavior is going to get much more scrutiny. I, I suspect that this uh, nanny teacher who Emhoff impregnated and got her fired from her job is probably not Jewish. By the Nazis, I had the chance to speak exclusively. And uh, th there are devastating stories that, that I've heard in Jewish life where Jewish, married Jewish men right, with multiple children have affairs with a non-Jewish nanny. And, and once a man is having a hot sexual relationship, he is predisposed to giving up everything for the sake of that hot sexual relationship. And so many a Jewish man has lost everything, has lost his family, lost his job, lost his position in his community, lost his religious and spiritual life as he's followed his penis into non-Jewish women and uh, ruined his own life, ruined his family, and, and ruined the non-Jewish nanny's life. And, and often Jewish men have given up everything that they have built over many years and uh, essentially followed their, their non-Jewish sexual partner into a life of exile. Exclusively today with Second Gentleman Doug Emhoff about his own efforts to fight anti-Semitism and other forms of hatred. So Jews who most practice Judaism are the least likely to get out there to fight anti-Semitism. There's no mitzvah in the Torah to fight anti-Semitism. From an Orthodox Jewish perspective, this is a, a pointless endeavor compared to the overwhelming imperative of following the commandments, none of which contain the admonition, fight anti-Semitism, right? This is a way for people who don't practice Judaism, right, who are not sacrificing for a traditional Jewish life to retain some semblance of connection to their tradition. 
You're the first Jewish spouse of a U.S. vice president, or president for that matter, and we're sitting down as the world is getting ready to mark International Holocaust Remembrance Day in the wake of the horrific October 7th uh, assault on Israel, the deadliest day for Jews, as you and I well know, since the Holocaust. Why is it especially important to commemorate this day this year? Wolf, um, that was a genocide, what happened uh, in the Holocaust. Uh, as they say, we can never forget. I was uh, there at Auschwitz last year uh, at International Holocaust Remembrance Day, and that this past year, uh, I've been profoundly affected by that experience, what I saw. Um, it's, it's never left me, and in fact, it's informed the work that I have done with the administration uh, on fighting anti-Semitism, hate of all forms, uh, which was very prevalent prior to October 7th. And of course, since October 7th, we've seen literally a crisis of anti-Semitism that has erupted. So Mark Halperin on a video last night has noted that this uh, Doug Emhoff affair story has behind the scenes destabilized the Kamala Harris campaign. Now, Emhoff boasts in the press that his goal is to be there for his family because one thing you can do for your children is have an affair with a popular teacher at their school that causes her to leave her job. Right? Kids never talk or tease about things like that. So the Kamala Harris campaign is telling journalists off the record that there is no child, but they do not respond to questions about whether the pregnancy was aborted. If there was a financial settlement with the teacher, there must be a non-disclosure agreement with the teacher. So powerful people, all right, can screw around and then get a handle on stories by paying people off and having people sign non-disclosure agreements. Fairly amazing that the Kamala Harris campaign can get the press to not report something, the pregnancy, by simply refusing to admit it or to respond. At this point, the pregnancy should not be hard for journalists to confirm, even if they don't trust the Daily Mail. Weird that the New York Times does not mention that the, st the woman was also the Emhoff's nanny, something that the Daily Mail reports. New York Times leaves out that the woman had to leave her job because of this, whether she was pregnant or not. This seems like a key detail. New York Times tries to render this story as boring as possible. There is a supportive statement from Doug Emhoff's first wife, the one that he lost over this affair. In the CNN news story, there is no supportive statement from his wife, Kamala Harris. So neither the Biden camp nor the Trump camp leaked this Doug Emhoff affair story where he knocked up his nanny teacher. Right, many journalists have known about it since 2020, but because I guess Doug Emhoff belongs to a sacred cause, the cause of the Democratic Party, no journalist published this story until now. So her main job was a teacher at a private school, Willows in Culver City, where Emhoff's kids attended. She moonlighted as a nanny with the Emhoff family. She lost her job at the school after the affair was discovered by Emhoff's wife. So this teacher paid the price for everything, not Doug Emhoff. And so Doug Emhoff says that uh, he wants to mobilize men for the cause of abortion. Right? How this is going to impact men, how he's going to start a family or not. Right, back to CNN. Here in the United States, but in fact all around the world. So it's really important uh, as this date is, is coming up uh, to commemorate the horrors of, of millions, six million Jews uh, slaughtered. Uh, and we both saw with our own eyes, Wolf. Right, if you're going to be taken seriously on sacred subjects, then it requires either a certain level of propriety in your own behavior or you're opening yourself wide up for valid criticism. Um, how it was done in those chambers and the crematoriums and in the case of, of, of my family and millions of others is shot in town squares and buried in ditches. Uh, a true Holocaust, a genocide, and it's so important that we never forget that and, and know that it happened. Push back on this misinformation and disinformation uh, and lead with education. I was uh, at Auschwitz uh, this past April. It was so powerful, so moving for me as a child of Holocaust survivors. What moments from your experience visiting Auschwitz stay with you to this day and sort of jump out at you all the time? I remember the, the starkness, the coldness, the barbed wire, the, the gun turrets. And as you know, it's preserved almost how it was. The, you just feel the desperation and uh, the horror. And for me, it's, it's looking at the personal effects, the, the shoes, the, the glasses, the hair. Of, of, the, of those slaughtered. 
uh, to see the, 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 the gas chambers and the crematoriums. You see the train that, that brought people in, some who, who just were led right to the gas chamber. It stays with you in such a visceral way. You're so the arguments for same-sex marriage are much easier to make on the pro-same-sex marriage side because the primary arguments from a conservative perspective are that uh, same-sex marriage destabilizes traditional values. And, and that's also a key conservative argument against abortion, that it destabilizes and desacralizes sex. And that's not immediately viscerally compelling if you don't hold to a traditional uh, perspective on life. And so... Patrick Buchanan uh, gave a, a culture war talk in the 1992 Republican convention, right? Saying that uh, the United States is a republic, that a republic requires citizens of a certain character, and that character is being eroded by the modern liberal state, by welfare, by paternalism of all kinds, right? By civil rights legislation. So normally a civilization develops standards by the vast majority of its population because different groups have different hero systems and different standards. For example, if you have a lot of East Asians moving to an area, they will try to create a more rigorous public school district that will be much more demanding and will be a very different public school district if it were primarily a white public school district or primarily a Latino public school district or primarily a black public school district, right? Different ethnic groups, different racial groups, have different hero systems, different levels of moral propriety. And so there's a cliche about a East Asians driving very slowly and carefully. Well, East Asians, compared to white people, compared to Latinos, and compared to blacks, tend to conduct themselves throughout life much more carefully than other groups, right? They are more careful about who they have sex with. They are more careful about the kind of behavior that leads to STDs and unwanted pregnancies. They are more careful about getting an education, and as a result, they live longer, they have lower crime rates, they have more family stability, they earn more money per hour, they are more educated. And uh, morality requires discipline, and it's a lot easier to maintain a hero system and a certain kind of moral discipline if you're in a homogeneous environment rather than a multicultural one. Because when you're living around a vast variety of hero systems, all right, it uh, will tend to erode your commitment to your unique hero system because you are increasingly exposed to what seems like the fictional nature of your hero system. Like, why should I sacrifice sexual pleasure when I, I see other groups having you know, many more parties and, and much more... Uh, sexual debauchery than my group enjoys? Why should I limit myself when I, I see other groups seemingly having a, a lot more fun? And so as Americans become more multicultural, we have more competing hero systems, and that tends to undercut uh, sexual discipline and other forms of discipline and other forms of morality because people are going to be less likely to constrain themselves once they become increasingly aware of other choices, right? It's easier to constrain yourself if you don't think there's a choice. But when you notice other hero systems and other forms of sexual morality, that's going to have more of an influence on you as opposed to living in a community where there's just one dominant hero system, where there's just one dominant uh, morality. Here is an interesting perspective from uh, Mark Halperin that is never brought up when Donald Trump is castigated for challenging the 2020 election results. Um, things about it last time, though? There were, there were way too many changes made based on COVID that should have been done more clearly and more fairly, but that doesn't mean the election was stolen, and those were the rules, and that's how our, our system works. But that's, that's all that happened last time. But... But I think this time will be different because I think there'll be more preparation to understand. I don't think there'll be the same patience for it. That's my I hope you're thought. right. Are you not here? Wow, what a commonsensical, you know, erudite, uh, pithy discussion there uh, compared to what you, you normally hear in the news media on this story. 
Uh, let's get a burst here from Fox News. Association disqualified both of them during its 2023 World Championships. The IBA said the two women failed gender eligibility tests. The IBA did not release specific details on how the women failed the test. Also last year, the International Olympic Committee stripped the IBA from its power to run Olympic boxing over finance and management issues. The IOC also says the IBA's testing process that involved Khalif and Lin Yuting were not legitimate. The tests themselves, the process of the tests, the ad hoc nature of the tests are not legitimate and you'll also expect me to tell you that I'm not going to discuss the individual intimate details of athletes. So uh, my friend Elliot Blatt says in the chat, vote by mail is clearly meant to enable voter fraud. We don't have any evidence that that is true. If we had evidence that that was true, then we'd have a stronger case. Yeah, on a commonsensical basis, uh, I can see how it would appear that uh, vote by mail is more encouraging of, of voter fraud. But bro, where are the studies? You're, you're relying on your gut. You're relying on your intuition, bro. But th those are weak epistemics. Where are your peer-reviewed academic studies that support your supposition that vote by mail is clearly meant to enable election fraud. So Pat Buchanan and his culture war speech is about, in large part, what happens when we unravel the moral fabric, right? When all sorts of things that were taken for granted forms of self-discipline uh, start to drop away. So Republicans in 1992, writes uh, Christopher Caldwell, August 2nd may have been too swaddled in free market ideology to understand what they were hearing. Uh, Pat Buchanan only took a quarter of the Republican vote in 1992, but people who did understand it received the message like an electroshock. The Republican Party would live on as a racket for its networkers, but it would not be taken seriously by its base again until it figured out what Pat Buchanan was talking about. That process would take about 24 years until the rise of Donald Trump. So if we look at the popular discontent out of which Reaganism arose in the late 1970s, this makes sense, right? There was a worry that civil rights agitation, strengthened by the full might of the federal government, was becoming a means to boss people around and grind the faces of the poor. So you can't expand rights for one group without taking away rights for other groups. It, it, it does sound beautiful. It does sound immediately compelling to have civil rights. Right, what normal person does not want to see every citizen enshrined with some civil rights, but with the civil rights passed in 1964 and then in further iterations, they simultaneously took away other rights. So on the face of it, civil rights seem fantastic. On the other hand, they always come at a price of other rights. So your right to rent out your home to whom you want are reduced by the civil rights legislation. Your rights to hire who you want are reduced by the civil rights legislation. All sorts of private choices are impinged upon by the civil rights legislation. So much so that the original constitution has effectively been replaced by a second civil rights constitution, argues Christopher Cordwell. So rights to freedom of association and rights to private property have been significantly reduced by civil rights legislation. So. It was just a worry in the late 1970s. It was not yet a grievance, but uh, it became writing on the wall. And the background, the, the moral fabric of society had been completely rewired by this extensive civil rights legislation and by the increasing dominance of a new understanding of morality. So the first uh, George H.W. Bush era was a kind of soft despotism, right? Operating under a system that journalists baptized political correctness during the 1989-1990 school year. This is the America of the Clarence Thomas confirmation hearing and the invention of sexual harassment. So this brought about a hardening in the country's cultural Reaganism. And then this burned itself out after the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995 and the explosion of Silicon Valley innovation. The problems seemed to be solved. That era ended, but the problems renewed themselves leading up to the election of Donald Trump in 2016.
So the cultural part of Reaganism was more important than the economic. All right, the government's glaring failure in the years since Lyndon Johnson's reforms of 1964 and 65, especially in civil rights and immigration law, to recover anything like the freedom, self-rule, and fellow feeling of the America that they overthrew. Today's sometimes majority, majoritarian populism is not yesterday's fringe discontent. So an elite can only rule if, if it is up against a disunited public, right? Because then when you have a multicultural public, then the elite can make alliances and continue its rule. But if the people discover common interests and band together, then the elite are much more likely to be replaced by a new elite. So Sam Francis, for all his disappointment with Republicans, he did not think of himself as fringe. Right? He claimed to speak on behalf of a profound social movement that reflects American society and that promises to dominate socially and culturally. You don't often hear Donald Trump speak this way. But there is the sense that there is a united people out there waited, waiting to be aroused and to be activated to create a united populist people around a revulsion of the civil rights and liberal revolution of the past 60 years. So a key foundation of the traditional conservative right-wing worldview is that there is a social order that exists outside of you, as opposed to the liberal conception of the buff itself who's able to create meaning and morality, purpose, and a path forward in life just through the use of his own autonomous will. So the right-winger is most likely to have an ethos of do your duty. The liberal most likely to have an ethos of follow your bliss. And uh, Ronnie Goodman's work in progress, Conservative Claims of Cultural Oppression on the Nature and Origins of Conservophobia, uh, explains this better than any other book of which I'm aware. So he notes that uh, Amy Wax observes that rational liberals are unmoved and unimpressed by social conservatives' vague premonitions of erosion or unraveling of the social order. Remember, to be right-wing is to believe that there's a social order, a system of morality, purpose, and meaning to which your purpose in life is to conform yourself. And for liberals, conservative fears about the erosion of this social order is an inadequate basis for resisting changes that satisfy immediate needs and urgent desires, such as same-sex marriage. So traditionalists have these vague premonitions about the unraveling of a social order. And for liberals, these are just lingering pre-modern sensibilities, which should not be allowed to interfere with uh, more modern forms of fulfillment.